Thanks so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm sorry that this will be in English, but um, I think, as you said, there's no other way. Um, I just want to say I'm really thrilled to be back in Madrid, which is a city I love so much, and especially thrilled to be talking to Charlie about his work. Um, and I first saw Charlie's work in the exhibition at the Fondation Cartier that you mentioned uh, in Paris, which was four years ago now, I think? Yeah. yeah? Um, and I have to say, I was really blown away by it. And I think it's quite interesting to think about that exhibition in terms of this exhibition, which is what we'll begin talking about today. Because um, it, there was a similar motif, which is these extraordinary paintings, which are obviously based on satirical prints from the Georgian and Regency period in England. And we'll talk about that in more detail. On these extraordinary um, kind of almost theatrical mise-en-scene created by these I always mistakenly call it wallpaper, and it's not. They're actually woodblock repeats. So, you, <coughs> yeah, yeah. A, it's a stamp that I um, make that's actually made out of kind of foam rubber, mm -hmm. but it's just like a woodblock print process, yeah. but directly onto the walls. Yeah. So the stamp is kind of this size yeah. and repeated, I think, about 500 times in this space. <laughs> <laughs> Must be quite time consuming to do. It's quite a laborious process, but yeah. I've become uh, quite efficient at doing it. Yeah. So as long as I've got someone with me who can help yeah. put the, the ink onto, the, uh, put the paint onto the stamp, yeah. then yeah, I kind of get into a zone and uh, print away. <laughs> so um, I want to begin by just asking you about this exhibition in particular. And I mean, it might be good to begin with the title. So the title, Swell. And I think <laughs> in that title, there's a, there's a play on words there. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So. Well, well, initially the title was going to be At Sea. Mm -hmm. That's what was going through my mind when I was making these paintings. And yeah. um, started, I started making works, looking at different imagery, and realised that a lot of the things I was looking at were related either to the sea or to some kind of confusion or strange um, feeling. <coughs> um, when it came to actually deciding on the title yeah. I was thinking more deeply about it and swell had a more resonance to me because it has this meaning to do with the sea like the swell of the sea yeah. big waves but also uh, colloquially means great great yeah you know, <laughs> this is this is going well <laughs> and then in, in terms of all of the imagery being you know derived from the sea or nautical imagery could you talk more about that because that seems obviously very specific and maybe specific to the moment that we're in, especially in the UK. You, you might not have heard, but it's a bit messy right now. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting place to be. So could you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, so I think I, when I was looking at the imagery that I was going to be working with, yeah. it wasn't, it didn't come from a feeling of like, oh, I need to make work about this yeah. kind of confusion. I think it was more of a subconscious thing that I was drawn to this kind of imagery that yeah. that made sense of confusion and of being at sea. Yeah. And it was later after I'd made some of the paintings that I realized, yeah, this does actually make a lot of sense to this kind of very chaotic moment that we're living in in the UK yeah. and in the world. And have been, you know, for five or six years now, it's been yeah. very turbulent and very yeah. Um, a very strange place to be yeah. living. Yeah. Um, and of course there's some very direct references to the sea, but also some of them, like this painting over here, which is called MOB, which stands for Man Overboard, yeah. is actually of a, a woman falling over the, the balcony of, um, of a staircase. Oh, I, I know this print. It's the one of um, the Royal Academy exhibition in Somerset exactly. House where they're all tumbling down the staircase. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So when, yeah, when, that was, when that drawing was made, the Royal Academy was in Somerset House. Yeah. And there's this very famous staircase that's still there. Yeah. Very beautiful spiral staircase. Yeah. And Thomas Rowlandson made a drawing um, of people clambering up the stairs yeah. to get to the Royal <coughs> Academy summer show. And in one point, there's um, this woman being pushed over the, yeah. over the, balcony, over the banisters <coughs> of the stairs. So, I mean, I think that this, this brings up another interesting issue for us to think about, which is I mean, two things. One is, I mean, 
I think the most striking thing about your work is that you know a young painter would be drawn almost exclusively, not entirely, but almost exclusively to essentially late 18th, early 19th century satirical prints by people like, you mentioned them, you know, James Gilray, George Cruikshank, William Hogarth. Um, so that's one thing. And if you could talk a little bit about how that happened and, and what you find so interesting about that material to work with and maybe why it's resonant. And then I won't give you too many things to think about. <laughs> the second thing I want to ask about is this, the way that you then transform the images through cropping and zooming and other things. Yeah. But, but first of all, in terms of the prints, um, so why, why those prints? The prints, well, um, initially my interest in, in those prints came from um, some George Cruikshank prints that my parents had when I was young. Yeah. I think they bought them when I was very young, or maybe before I was born, yeah. and we had them in the house. And I would be very drawn to looking at them. And Because they're probably quite bawdy and... and yeah, they were all about fashion, these ones. So yeah. they were, people in like big dresses, kind of flowing dresses and like very tight suits and yeah. uh, mostly like walking through Regent's Park. Mm -hmm. So different scenes from different years, like as the fashions changed. Yeah. And I was drawn to, yeah, the, the boardiness, but also I remember finding it really fascinating looking close into the prints and where they'd been coloured in. Yeah. And the, I suppose the sort of abstraction of them when you get close yeah. and often they'd be coloured in a bit wrong so sometimes a mistake would be made yeah. and an area that should have been the sky would be coloured in pink from a, a dress yeah. Yeah. and I found that really interesting that it, it still made sense but it was kind of wrong and it was like a slippage a slippage exactly yeah. 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 and which I couldn't figure out what fascinated me about that at the time, but yeah. I found it really interesting. Yeah. And then when I was at art, art school, um, at the Royal Academy Schools, I started looking more in depth at the um, other prints and drawings from uh, contemporaries of George Cruikshank yeah. and from a bit earlier as well. Yeah. And um, they had a, a great library there. They still have a great library there. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, so I started looking at uh, Gilray, James Gilray, <coughs> Thomas Rowlandson, yeah. William Hogarth, and collecting images of, of their prints and drawings, yeah. and then finding the bits in them that really fascinated me. Because yeah. I wasn't so interested in the, the whole. Of or, course, the, or the narrative, even. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, which is of course fascinating, yeah. but um, what interested me w was finding parts of the prints that said something more generally than the narrative that they were trying to yeah. um, explain. That transcends that time even. Exactly. Yeah, um, Yeah, that's really well put. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing to say about, you know, prints from that period is, um, we're very lucky at the National Portrait Gallery, we have a very large collection of them, so Gilray, etc. And um, we're in the middle of a big refurbishment. I'm not going to make this about me, I'm just going to sit on the side. <laughs> we're in the middle of a big refurbishment, and when we reopen next summer, we're going to have an ex um, a room devoted to them for the first time. And the thing to say is that um, in terms of portraiture, it was this, or just even you know how images were circulated, it was this incredibly important moment where it could be democratised. So the fact that you had printing presses and you could print en masse these images, but that they could then comment on, you know, the royal family of the day or politicians, this, this, the importance of satire and being able to have these debates in public circulated. It's, they're kind of the forerunners of the internet, for better or for worse. I mean... <coughs> yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. And I, that was so important to be able to be able to poke fun at the establishment yeah. and get that um, distributed to lots of people. Yeah. Um, would have made a big difference to the way people thought about society. And, yeah. Yeah. and then in terms of the, because obviously, you know, you, you take the source material and, for example, like this one, when you mentioned the particular print, I actually could recognise it. But obviously, as you say, you don't literally recreate the print. And I, I think in a way the gap between the original print and what you do with it is really interesting and is the core of your work. 
So could you talk a little bit about that kind of process of translation, whether it's the cropping and the fragmentation, or even, as you say, you know, turning a print, which was often either you know, a, a monoprint, like a, not a monoprint, but just like you know, one color, or occasionally hand-colored. But obviously, you, you take those colors and you often translate them into very highly, key, a very highly keyed palettes. Um, or the way that you turn the, you know, the, the printing marks, you know, the cross-hatching of printing into painterly gesture. So could you talk through us about that process of translation and transformation? Mm. So, well, one of the things I, when I was first looking into the, the prints and looking at these um, uh, prints and drawings, mm. well, especially the prints, actually, was that they would often be, you could find different versions in different colorways. Yeah. And this was because they'd be printed at different times. Yeah. So they'd be, the, the, print, the etching plate would be made by the artist and then printed and then usually colored by someone else yeah. uh, who'd be paid to color in a lot of a whole yeah. stack of prints. Um, and they'd be told what colors to do. Yeah. And they would usually just be whatever the colors were that were in fashion at the time, yep. especially the clothes. Yeah. Uh, but then often, 50 years later or 100 years later, the, the, the etching plate would still be in good condition and mm. could be re-editioned. So then it would be reprinted and someone else would be told to color them in. Yeah. And they'd be in completely different colors because the fashions would have changed. Um, <laughs> so you might have a kind of a Regency print yeah. that was then coloured in the Victorian times <laughs> and so sometimes stripes would be added yeah. onto clothes or taken away if that wasn't in fashion at the time or dots. Yeah. Um, so for me that gave me, well when I was starting to do it, I felt like it gave me licence to add my own colours and think about my own colourways yeah. and um, that was relevant to the time that I'm painting it in. And, and you can almost chart like a history of taste or style through their shifting yeah. lives and appearances. Very interesting. I mean, the other thing which I, I mentioned a little bit in the text I wrote about your work for the exhibition is it reminds me to this, this kind of meeting of, you know, technology. So, you know, the, the printing press being able to circulate these images for the first time and mass produce them and, you know, have them coloured. It reminds me a little bit of, of what pop artists in the 1960s were grappling with, people like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, where they were taking, it's not dissimilar, that they were taking, you know, comic books and the bende dots of comic books that, that creates that pattern and hand painting them. And is that something that you find interesting, this idea of taking a, a mass produced image and then hand painting it and turning it into a unique yeah, I think it allows me uh, a lot of scope to to bring my own expression into yeah. that bit of imagery. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe even more so than than the kind of meticulous copy that yeah. that might be of like copying bende dots or something. Yeah. Um, I feel like when the, my paintings are working very well to me is when I'm kind of breaking out of the constraint of that imagery and, and yeah. um, playing with it and playing with the paint on the surface. Yeah. And in terms of you know, the images, I mean, obviously we understand the, the references, but where, where do you find them? Do you just have lots of books and catalogues? Are you always looking at the originals? Do yeah, you collect I've, them? I've got a lot of books and catalogues. I do, I've started to collect yeah. the prints. Um, yeah, we're running out of space in our flat. <laughs> we need uh, a bigger flat, I think. <laughs> um, and, and also, on, I collect the digital Im images of them as well. Yeah. There's a lot of imagery online that I've been finding. Um, and yeah, I used to go frequently to Andrew Edmonds' shop, and it's very sad he died this year. Yeah, he's a great print dealer in, in London of this material. He yeah. just died, yeah. And a good restaurant if you're in London, by the way. Yeah, which is still, yeah. uh, still there. <laughs> and uh, Hot yeah, tip. it's a really good restaurant, yeah. <laughs> um, and then to, to come back to this exhibition, 
So, you know, I, I was lucky enough to see these works in your studio this summer. And, you know, I have to say, walking in today and seeing the exhibition, the difference when, when they're then in situ in this wallpaper, sorry, not wallpaper, the, <laughs> but the, the, the mural. Um, can, you, can you sort of talk about why that's important for your work? Like, you, you don't just hang paintings in a room, you do create this entire world for them. And, and maybe that tension between the kind of the painting and the environment. Mm. Yeah, it's something that I've done for the last 10 years, really since, well, I started making these kind of printed walls when I was um, at art school still. Yeah. And so the, the first time was, for, yeah, for my degree show yeah. at the Royal Academy Schools. And I liked the way the, the paintings interact with the, with the print. Yeah. Um, and also the idea that so often in the gallery, you, a painting will be hung on a white wall. That's yeah. the kind of standard. But it's actually quite rare that that will then go on to be hung on a white wall anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a, someone's home or in a museum, so often there's choices to be made and there's so much scope as to what you can do. Yeah. I felt like, in a way, it's a shame not to play with that. Yeah. Um, I don't have a problem at all with my work being hung on a white background. I think that can look really good, but yeah. it's only one option. Yeah. And given there's so many other options, it's, it's fun to, to, for me to, to play with that. I mean, do, do you think of yourself as a painter exclusively? Or, because it seems that, I mean, obviously they're, they're paintings mostly, but there seems to be, they almost, your practice is kind of pushing against that as well. In terms of the source material, prints, mm -hmm but then the environment that you show them in. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I do see myself as a painter, but maybe that is a bit reductive because it's so specific and yeah. I, um, I prefer a more like expansive term, like, or just like an artist really, because um, I think, yeah, I love painting, but yeah. um, I also love making installations and yeah. objects and, printmaking and all these other kind of creative processes. Yeah, because I mean, even not just the fact that you, you're looking a lot at print and, that, and that's a lot of the source material and then the kind of architectural installation, but even the way that you, you kind of crop them, it seems quite cinematic or even a relationship to photography. Like mm -hmm. your eye isn't just painterly, it's kind of cinematic in a way. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're so, lucky in our age to be able to crop things. It must have been so much more difficult in the 18th century to yeah. think about a crop because you didn't have before photography and True. Um, now with digital photography, it's so easy to, on a computer, to crop things and, and to like play around with things yeah. in a very easy way, very kind of fluid way. And of, of course now we're all used to layering and when you look at a screen often, if you're like me and you're chaotic and you've got lots of things open at the same time, you've got this kind of layering of you know different yeah. screens and different windows, and I think that shines with this practice in a way that you have this layering of images, the surface, the environment, mm -hmm. and a layering within the paintings as well. Yeah, they're always made with layers of colour, and it takes time to build it up and allow them to dry. Yeah, and it makes a big difference to have <laughs> so like this blue area here has a kind of green underneath, for example. Yeah. That would be very different if it was just blue painted onto white. It would have a very different look to it. Um, so in, in terms of the process of making the paintings, um, ha has it changed? I mean, looking at your work over the last 10 years, it seems like it's changed quite a bit. Like the earlier work <coughs> looks more, much more wet. And it seems now, as you say, that you kind of work in, in layers. Mm. Can you talk us through the process of making one of these works? Is it fairly rapid? Is it quite painstaking? It's, it is a kind of a layered process. Yeah. Um, when I'm actually, at, like physically painting, mm -hmm. it is quite rapid and I, it's important to, to maintain the kind of energy of the brush strokes. I try and work quite quickly, yeah. but the preparation to, to get to that point uh, is quite painstaking. Yeah. And there's usually layers of, Color built up, and then it's yeah. So in the in the final layer, that's when um, I try and work more quickly. Yeah. 
and I'll have all my paints already mixed up and so I spend a lot of time doing that yeah. um, and then try and work fairly quickly to kind of keep uh, a kind of an energy to the yeah. to the brush strokes and and do you work in um, series or is it more about an accumulation of individual paintings because you said obviously this has a has a theme which is nautical you know sea imagery um, but that you almost didn't realize that until you produced the work so yeah. do you sort of start out thinking I'm going to look at this area and make a whole body of work or it's much more organic it's yeah it's a good question I think sometimes I do yeah um, with this body of work I, I didn't really I was making works just in the studio and it kind of came together yeah. in a slightly more organic way I suppose yeah um, but in it's a good ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I certainly, yeah, I have made bodies of work where it's been sometimes based all around one print where I've taken different sections yeah. of that print. So the last exhibition here in this gallery, yeah. five years ago, uh, all of the paintings were from one print. Right. Um, but I'd taken like little tiny sections from yeah. all around it. So in a sense, there was a kind of theme to that. And a kind of seriality as well, which is interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, but I hadn't repeated the same section more than once. Yeah. Um, it was just similar types of imagery. You've also, um, I want to allow time for questions, so I'm going to throw it over to the, to the audience in a second. But um, you've also focused a lot on gesture, which I think is interesting. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so um, the yeah, I, I, gesture is something I look at a lot in within the prints themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's often like a particular gesture of a figure in a, the print that appeals to me when I'm looking through the imagery. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, when I'm painting, there's it's very much about gesture and yeah. movement of the paint around the canvas and how that works and how I control that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's what you were yeah, no, no, that, looking that, for. That's <laughs> it. Are there um, other questions? Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. So, do you mean... Um, like you're protecting yourself from like, keeping the past, so you're more like, let's, let's keep... Yeah, I, um, so I suppose I'm like celebrating el elements of the past mm -hmm. in, in looking at these prints and drawings, but also creating something new that's uh, to do with myself and my own expression. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure exactly what the... So, like, w with your calm down, how was this, like, more than, like, was the experience influenced more than uh, having that, that special book? You know, how was this? Um, well, you also protect yourself, like, you know, of the past. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a good title, like, Protectors Protect of the Past. Protectors of the Past. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. it, it's good. I, yeah. I've not really thought about it in terms of protecting the past, but um, like they're not sort of super traditional, if that's what you mean. They're, they're quite progressive in their opinions and ideas and 
um, the way they live. And yeah, I think in a way like these prints and drawings that I look at, even though they're kind of historic and old, they're also not traditional in a, in a sense. Yeah. They're, they're quite like relevant still. They're and very modern in a way, yeah. in like in terms of what they're doing and the satire and the humor and the kind of politics of them and the, all kinds of things, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is that tension though. It's really interesting that, you know, again, like a young artist, I won't say painter, <laughs> uh, would be drawn to, to, you know, mostly focusing on, on this material and within it drawing out so many different themes and ideas and it is very interesting. I mean, it's very, there's no one else doing it. It's very unusual. Um, and that tension, I think, is interesting between it being very contemporary and very progressive and quite experimental, but also drawing from something in the past. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer the question? Is that? <laughs> other, other questions? Yes. It's a pleasure. Mm. I'd like to know, if possible, when you look at a print, how do you choose one image? What's the drive behind mm -hmm. it? Good question. The yeah. and it out it, that's a good question. And I don't have like a specific criteria when I sit down and... and so that's why I say the yeah. drive. Yeah. I think it is quite a... Uh, an instinctive feeling for me, like something, if something excites me within the yeah. print, I, li I don't like to look too hard as to what that might be because I feel like that could somehow spoil the, the energy for me. Like there'll be something I like and I'll immediately look at that and maybe straight away like um, scan it and crop that section. And often I'll try and like, disregard the, the narrative as much as possible from, from the rest of the print so that it doesn't influence too much what I'm interested in in, in my initial like, excitement about that section of, of that piece. Well, you, were t you were talking about energy and gesture. Yeah. And I'm interested in that in relationship to your yeah. paintings. And, and lots of them capture movement as well, which I think yeah, is interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, and I suppose, like sometimes I'll find a, a, a section of the print that I feel captures a kind of essence of what the whole print's trying to talk about, but it might just be in one small gesture or one small like section, even quite an abstracted part of the print that at first might not be clear what's going on, but for me might, it feels like that's capturing the essence of what the artist is trying to talk about, yeah. And could you talk about, about drawing, because drawing seems yeah. to be Fundamental. a very important thing in your painting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, lo a lot of the, yeah, the source material that I, I look at is, is prints and drawings. And no, it's your drawing, I mean. Or also like turning drawing and line into painting, I think is very interesting, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's something which often takes a, a bit of patience in a painting because the kind of drawing element of it usually needs to be right at the end. So I have to build up areas of colour yeah. and then it's only in the last part of making the painting that, so like on this one, the, the black lines, if I do them too early on, then they just, it all gets all smudged together. So it's has to be built up. And at the end, um, and then also with the, with the prints on the wall, they start from a, a drawing that I make, yeah. um, like a traditional, like usually a watercolour on paper. Um, and that's made, so this one just came from my own imagination, looking at lots of images of the sea and also other like prints and drawings of the sea. But I made a kind of, amalgamation of them and then created this pattern which I wanted to be able to join up with itself 
so that it could be kind of continuous around them. It the almost reminds me of like Hokusai, you know, those depictions of waves in Japanese mm -hmm. prints as well. Um, there was a question here as well? Yeah, yeah. I, I, had a, I had a question. So I think what's really interesting, right, is the way you're actually playing with this sort of idea of narrative, right? So by mm -hmm. popping, yeah. you're kind of inviting the, the, the viewer to kind of create their own narrative that's maybe separate from where it originally came from. I think it's really painful. I, I just wondered, with that original, those original prints, how important to you is actually the narrative from that original print that you're making it from? And is it relevant and connected to, to what you then produce? Or is it completely divorced? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And um, I, I try and um, kind of crop out a lot of the narrative of the original print, which I think, I mean, the, the prints, they do fascinate me. And the, the narrative of them is always interesting to learn about. Mm -hmm. And it says a lot about the history of the time, um, but to make them, I suppose, more relevant to myself, I try and crop away a lot of the narrative, mm -hmm. and by focusing on a small section, that usually works. Sometimes I even collage bits together, or I'll crop a section and then like remove a part. So like the big painting over there, the top section, which is all dark, I kind of I painted over that. In the original um, print, there's other things going on in there, but I wanted to make it completely like a kind of dark space. <clears throat> um, and I think that allows me and also the, the viewer to create their own narrative around them. Mm. Um, and that's important for me. I, I want people to bring their own thoughts to what's going on, rather than telling people exactly what's happening yeah. and why that's happening. The also, um, language, of course, is, I think, is it the first time that you have these speech bubbles yeah. and these, that this seems input, this seems like a new part of the work as well, including in a couple yeah. of the works, yeah. Yeah, this is the first time. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, and actually, like, the prints that I was looking at, it's probably one of the first times that 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 was used in as a kind of graphic language, yeah. like in a comic like, book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the speech bubble. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I, d I haven't really researched that, but yeah. it's the first time I've seen it um, in certainly in like British in, in the kind of British graphic history. Yeah. Um, I guess this is probably around the 1790s. This idea of putting text in a bubble yeah. that someone's mm -hmm. speaking. So yeah, there's two examples of that, and actually one of the other, one of the paintings in the next room, there's not text, but you can see the beginning of the bubble. Yeah. There's two figures um, in the painting, and they're saying something, but I've kind of cropped that out. And actually, it seems so kind of weirdly relevant or contemporary, the way we're used to text messages and these little texts and little bubbles popping up, but kind of nothing has changed since this in a way. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, were there, yes, another question. So I find, thank you, it was really interesting. Oh. I really like the way you kind of work backwards from what we see. So what we see, you know, we see the lines and then you see the colour and you see the layers of paint on the canvas, but you work kind of from the bottom up. And so I was wondering, because normally works on canvas is something that people can go back to, artists can go back to and work on top of that. Of course, one, once your lines go in, that's it. Mm. But previous to the actual drawing, when you're doing the layers of colour, some areas are more densely coloured, like the corner of that, um, you know, you're drawing up over the balustrade, and the others seem more layered and kind of transparent. Do you go back to the colour base often and work intensely on that before you say, okay, I'm ready to do the drawing, the kind of a dark outline? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that. Um, with the <laughs> we were talking about phones it's perfect it's great <laughs> yeah. um, so the the drawn element that you're talking about it doesn't mean that I can't like w work back into it it would just mean I'd need to then add the drawing back on top so I don't feel like it's sort of 
limits me. Like I don't feel like once that's in, I can't touch it. Um, and often I would sit, like have what might seem like a finished painting and then not be happy with the colour and go over the whole thing again. But then would still need to reintroduce the drawing at the end. Mm -hmm. Any <coughs> final questions? Yes, yeah, yeah. May I ask why do you have this different uh, character written <laughs> in the wall? So yeah, there's three um, heads that I... Yeah, well spotted. Produce. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not everybody sees them. <laughs> um, <coughs> So yeah, when I was making the, the watercolour the, of the waves, I also made some, some drawings of heads, which I thought would be fun to put in. And yeah, and I brought them along and I wasn't sure whether to include them or not, but I thought just to have one of each. There, there's three and they're all different. Yeah. Um, so they're just kind of heads, like, yeah, bobbing in the, in the seat. <laughs> Were there any? Yes. Um, so very, very interesting. Uh, and I want to ask you, uh, since you're in Spain, apart from your inspiration in the, in the prints, uh, are you inspired by artists like Goya and Gutierrez Solana? Because some of the faces remind, remind you. Yeah, yeah I'm a <clears throat> I am. I've not, I've not used the imagery in my work before, but I'm always yeah, fascinated by other artists from, they were from a very similar time in history. Um, I don't know if they would have seen, they might well have seen, I guess Roland's mm -hmm. might, might have, would have probably seen Goya etchings. Yeah, and there's similar elements of satire in Goya, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure they must have, I would imagine. I mean, given the, the nature of, of an etching and how it can be moved around so easily, yeah. I would have thought that yeah. It's likely that yeah. Rowlandson and Gilray would have seen Goya etchings. And we also, and they, tra they, they did travel as well, yeah. so they, they probably came to... We probably to borrowed Spain. from Spain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other... I've got a kind of final question, but I want to make sure that everyone who has questions has had a chance. Yes? Okay. Um, because of the politics of satire, I mean, it's something that you've been using, um, do you, do you think about like a political statement whenever you're thinking about like making a show? Is it something you're using or you want to use uh, from um, by taking back uh, those works into the contemporary scene? Um, do you think about it or it's something that just happens? Like for example, you were mentioning in the beginning about like the uh, what's happening in the UK right now, no? mm -hmm. like this turmoil that's going on. Is it something that you think about when you're doing a show or not really? Yeah, that, I think that's a good question. I, I don't think, it's not something which I want to kind of have as a, like I'm not trying to be like didactically political and say like, this is about this. It is more open than that. And, I, and um, yeah, maybe that answers. But I think, I think you allow viewers to, to make those associations. So when I was thinking about your work, writing the text, you know, thinking about all these images from around the Napoleonic Wars, and they're nautical, but they're basically about Britain as an island, which is what Brexit's really about. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, but also the, all these discussions we're having over like, you know, small boats and migrants crossing. And I, I, I was thinking of all of the, I mean, I'm not saying that this is what the work is about, or that's why you made it, but I was layering the, the then and the now, and yeah. so I think I think that's really valid. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I find that very exciting as well as a yeah as an idea that people can bring that, and also that I can bring that to the work, but not have to be explicit about like this is about crossing, yeah. about like migrants or or about Brexit or any yeah. of those kind of things. You leave um, it open for people to bring their own references or interpretations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Why yeah. Quite maybe, but I wonder, <laughs> in doing this, did you actually did you get a sense of comfort out of it? Because in some ways, it's like it's like a hundred years on, right? But it's like these themes are still relevant. You can still take elements from these old kind of prints and you know bring some kind of 
modern relevance to it. So it's almost like there's a lot of turmoil, but there's also some kind of link to yeah. the past, some kind mm. of element of not stability, but sort of... Well, comfort in that yeah. we've always had, like, chaotic times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think yeah. that's, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I've got a final question, if there's no more, and um, I just, again, maybe, maybe maybe it's not fair, but I was just curious to ask you what's next, if you know what you're going to be working, I mean, not as a project as such, but as a, as imagery, or are you thinking, are you making the next thing, are you thinking about the next thing? Um, I think as soon as I'm back in the studio, that's what I need to think about. <laughs> but that's really exciting for me, because I've got, um, I've always got lots of things, kind of, Lots of images stored and lots of books to look at and things that I've might have seen like a few years ago but then not worked on and it's um, exciting to kind of go back to those things yeah. and find new things but no I don't have a an answer to that that's kind of a specific thing right. but maybe ask me in like a couple of weeks and, <laughs> and, then, and then I might have to. We watch the space and I think yeah. we look forward to the next exhibition. So um, that was fabulous. Thank, please join me. Thank you all for being here and join me in thanking Charlie as well. For and thank you, Nick. Thanks very much. Thank